Okay, welcome to Destination the Show, episode eight. After a ten-day hiatus or so, back in the saddle with Jeremy Nygaard. Jeremy, what's up, man? What's new? You know, uh, yeah, like you mentioned that one-week break, and and a lot <laughs> of things happened in that, in that one-week break. So, so there's a lot. Think- there's really a lot that's new, but really a lot that's still the same. A lot that's new. Since the last time we spoke, the Twins, the Brewers were eliminated in the wildcard yeah. round. The Twins won three playoff games, got eliminated by the defending champs, and... But the, the whole baseball world was turned upside down, and we need to redo the postseason and... <laughs> The sky is falling. All of those things happened in the last 14 days. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's been a lot. The twin season is over. I think you were at the game last night. What was your reaction to the result? And how are you viewing the 2023 season as a Twins fan? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because I think if if anybody would have said before the season, Twins are going to end the streak, they're going to win a series – they're going to, you know, kind of have home field advantage just for a moment. Uh, <laughs> I think that all feels like a win. For sure. But given how the season went, it always felt like the Twins were capable of more. Mm-hmm. And having the pitching that they had as good as it was late in the season and then kind of getting healthy again, I think people started to believe that maybe there was a possibility that there could be more. Yep. And so, I mean, it's, it's the mix of disappointment because – there was a chance, but also last night's atmosphere. I didn't get to experience Ooh. the wild card atmosphere, but last night was it was a whole lot of fun. It was just not the result that you hoped for. Last night's atmosphere was rocking, man. And that is in spite of some pretty miserable middle innings. But I don't know how you experienced it. But after that, Eddie Julian home run and whatever inning that was, sixth or seventh, the place was absolutely raucous for the rest of the yeah. game it was great but, he, but even early like first pitch of the game and it felt like the ninth inning yep like you don't get to experience all of those like every pitch felt like a huge pitch and that's just and i don't know how the wild card round felt i'm assuming it probably felt similar but it was not remember <laughs> afternoon game. You, don't, you don't remember <laughs> people that's tell me it was good yeah so i mean to get that type of atmosphere to get to be able to enjoy that as a fan, I mean that that's huge. So, yep. you know, disappointing that it's over, but you just you you you're happy with the you, you and and the future's brighter, right? I mean, it is. Yeah, Gray's a free agent, but you look at the core, and it's like the core is now young and not the aging. How, do they have another year in them? You'd expect them to to go in as the favorites in the AL Central next year. Agreed, 100%. I think my two big disappointments in amongst a season of overwhelming positivity are two things. One, the offense was so much better in the second half of the season that to have two no-shows, essentially, in a row against Javier and Arquiti, six hits across two games at target field, felt really, really disappointing. And I think, like you mentioned, coming back to target field 1-1 in the series, it really felt like at least, at the very least, the Twins might be able to force a game five. And that would have been just, I, I like, I don't know if I would have been able to endure that, but it would have been incredibly fun. Pablo absolutely shoved in game two. But I'm not going to quibble quibble too much with that. It was it was fun, man. It was super fun. Yeah, um sure. Okay, DTS episode eight. We're going to focus on a couple topics today. We're in the thick of the MLB playoffs. Um, A wide range of outcomes for the teams that we cover. So we're going to spend some time digging into the rookie classes from each team. Um, And we'll start off with some kind of news and notes and interesting topics in the world of amateur baseball. And we'll finish with um, some listener questions here. So... Now that the Cubs, Brewers, 
and twins are all done. Sad day, sad trombone. Jeremy, any guesses where any of these teams are going to be picking in the 2024 draft? I cannot wait to start talking about it. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously the Cubs were were in it until they weren't late in the season. So you're looking at brutal teens, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I guess more teams make it now, so mid, mid-teens. mid um, Brewers went out in the first round, so they're in that next group of four, and the Twins went out in the next round, so they're in that next group of four. Yep. Uh, so, I, you know, like I mentioned to you on Twitter, or X or whatever it's called, <laughs> they're all going to be drafting. You're a nightmare. In the same <laughs> six or seven picks, which is yes. the worst thing to do. Because it's like, oh, Cubs picked. And then you put it in, and then all of a sudden the Twins have picked and the Brewers have picked, and now it's just playing catch up. So that's a bummer. But um, the, also, when you're drafting earlier in the in the draft, like there's a lot more anticipation of picks For five, sure. nine, and thirteen. And when you're picking sixteen, twenty, and twenty-four, that's even less fun. Yep, agreed. Especially when you consider potentially a weaker class. However, for an excited second in my Post Twins elimination despair, I started looking up records and trying to think about who was going to pick where. And I realized that actually none of this is decided. And if fate intervenes in a certain way, they could be a little more spaced out than we might imagine, right? So Cubs did not make the playoffs somehow. So they are lottery lottery eligible. Um, I mean, the chances of them moving up are... I mean, there are probably there are even less than the chances of the the twins moving up last year. So that's a long shot, but we'll see. By record, because draft positions are determined by by record um, after we get to the playoffs, depending on the round in which teams were eliminated. The Brewers would pick twentieth, and the Twins would pick twenty third. But there's a little X factor here: Yankees, Mets, and Padres all of whom did not make the playoffs and so are are lottery eligible. All three of those teams, if they don't move up into the top six and land a top six pick, their draft spot is going to fall 10 picks automatically because each of those teams exceeded the luxury tax by more than $40 million. So in those cases... Yankees, Mets, and Padres all might incur a 10-spot drop for their first pick in the 2024 draft. And we won't know any of this until the draft lottery during the winter meetings. So, again, that's just for the first round. Yep. Yep. And so every other round, it's going to be those three teams picking. Even if they move up in the lottery, they're going to be picking in the same seven picks. Yep. So you're telling me we might get a, a little bit of a break, a, on, a reprieve, a reprieve on that, on that like first night round. when there's when there's actual time in between picks, we'll get a break. <laughs> but when it's rapid fire, there will be no break. Correct. That's exactly what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is to start recruiting help for updating the draft trackers at three websites in unreasonably short turnaround. Yeah. In addition to potentially live streaming the entire draft. Yeah, because, I mean, you could have other things, too. And I and I was way better at remembering all the draft rules when they were simpler. Um, yep. You know, a team signs a, a free agent, they're going to drop or lose a pick. Mm-hmm. If, if a team loses a free agent, they're going to gain a pick. You know, Sonny Gray is going gonna, is gonna to net the Twins a pick at some point. Yep. I don't know what round that's going to be because it depends on – how much he signs for, how long he signs for, mm-hmm. probably who signs him, all of those things. Yep. But, yeah, obviously there's going to be some stuff that happens that make that first round a little bit more of a mess. And there's going to be a rookie of the year here named, and I'm assuming that somebody's going to net another draft pick. None of these three teams. but None of these three teams. going to be another draft pick for somebody there. That was weird because, like, when teams were making their first round pick last year, but they were making it – like in the forties, mm-hmm. like that just seems messed up. Yep. That was the but, Dodgers, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely going to be prospect promotion picks and we're going to get into all of this further down the line around the winter meetings. We will break down draft pools in detail, but 
I learned something new, seeing as you brought it up, I learned something new about the prospect promotion incentive picks this very week. So check this out. I think we talked about this a couple of episodes ago, but the only way that the, the PPI pick has been earned so far is by a player winning rookie of the year, right? Julio Rodriguez for, for Seattle netted them a pick after the first round. You can also gain that pick via a top three finish. Nice cup. A top three finish in the MVP or Cy Young voting. But the new piece of information I learned is that any player who qualifies for that PPI incentive, so someone who's on two of those three preseason top 100 lists amasses the required service time, is eligible for a PPI pick throughout their pre-arbitration years with the team. Really? So, for example, if Brooks Lee, who will be a top 100 prospect on all three of those lists, one would imagine preseason 2024, came up, spent the uh, necessary service time with the Twins in 2023, didn't win Rookie of the Year, he could still receive a PPI pick in subsequent years pre-arbitration for a top three MVP finish. Obviously, that's an insanely high bar. Just a little nugget I did not know. So what happens when uh, when Royce Lewis wins MVP next year? <laughs> so I don't think I don't think Lewis qualifies for a PPI pick, right? Um, not not enough service time in his rookie year. I'm guessing he doesn't meet that threshold. Wasn't he I'm still a rookie sh- this year? Yeah, he's a rookie this year, but he. He, I don't think he missed the the amount of service time necessary to qualify, right? I don't know, and I'm also not sure of what his placement on on preseason top 100 list was. He was in all the lists, top 100 this year. This year, coming in. Oh yeah. Okay, we gotta we gotta go back and fact check that because well, that piques my interest. The, that's the thing. Like, there's so little information up. I know about that. Like, even the and this is getting a little off track, a lot off track, but like the limited options for pitchers Mm -hmm. there's nowhere in the cba that actually says that yep so is that a real rule or is it one of those like made up rules and now we believe yeah it actually doesn't exist it's hard because even some of the some of what was like published about some of these like new rules and conditions and pieces of the collective bargaining agreement right were um subject to certain things being agreed like a bunch of information out there still um, pertains to a like um, international draft and so on, which is not something that's been <clears throat> instigated yet. So definitely agree. It's pretty murky. It's pretty cloudy. We got to do our Royce Lewis homework now because um, you piqued my interest. But that's a little nugget on the PPI pick. Um, here's the last thing I wanted to, to touch on and bring up and get your thoughts on, man, before we dig into rookie classes. Let me try... I make sure I don't butcher the pronunciation here. Rintaro Sazaki, Japan's top high school prospect. This is big news, man. This is super interesting, I think. Has opted to forego the NPB draft and head to college in the United States, presumably, although not confirmed, to play for the Vanderbilt Commodores. Sazaki's father, I guess, was Shohei Otani's advisor. Um, yeah, six foot, 250 pound first baseman. Yeah. 70 grade power. He hit 140 home runs in high school in Japan, I guess, mostly off kind of mid eighties velocity. So less than he would see collegiately in the United States. I think scouting stuff I read on him had him as a pick somewhere in the round, uh, in rounds two to four. He would be draft eligible in 2027. And I think the other thing that came up about him was NIL um, earnings, name, image, and likeness, pretty uncertain due to the the particular type of visa he would be here playing on. What are your thoughts, man? That's such a fascinating turn of events. It really is. And it's it's interesting because this type of thing happening is something that gets talked about all the time. Mm -hmm. Like they're not going to... They're not going to, you know, file the application and then they do, or 
you know, just just rumors of 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 these players from Japan skipping out on the, the pro league in Japan uh, to come to America, but it's never actually happened. And so, you know, I think with with Suzaki and and he's the the type of profile that this maybe doesn't make sense for the most, mm-hmm. right? If you had yeah. a, a a two way guy, if you had a like an up the middle defender, maybe uh, or a, or just a pitcher. Like mm-hmm. those are the types of guys that you see get drafted, um, and with the NIL uncertainty, there's just there's so many. Like, is this a good idea? But I think the reality is, is, is he and his uh, the smarter people that make decisions for him mm-hmm. see a, an avenue where if you go to a, an American university the path to making more money is shorter for sure. And that that's to me, that's kind of the long end, the short of it. Is it going to make, is it going to be a great deal for him? Maybe not. Mm-hmm. If it works out well, this is going to be a, a, a thing yes. that happens all the time. Yep. If this doesn't work out well, like how was he welcomed back to Japan? You know, Otani did his thing. He's a hero. Suzuki did his thing. Mm-hmm. Ichiro did his thing. He's a hero. If you leave at 18 years old, are you ever going to be welcome back? Mm-hmm. And so that's that's the 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 line that he's chosen to cross. And I think that's what makes this even more fascinating because this isn't this isn't the the pitcher that throws 101 that's the best pitching prospect in the world. This is a, a f- short, big, <laughs> power hitting first baseman, which are maybe the Careful. least valued. <laughs> demographic in the sport yep and yep. so that's where this this is such a unique thing but even a little more unique because of because of the setup i am so interested to track this and see how this works out for him man i mean if anyone watching this or listening to this has a little time to kill just look up Rintaro Sazaki tanks because he absolutely annihilates baseballs. He's very entertaining to watch. Um, I just like love the idea that he has ample faith in himself to hop up from like mid eighties velocity to like imagine like facing Chase Burns or something, right? Like a hundred and one mile per hour fastball. I just like I can't wait to see what that adjustment is like and how he does. And I hope he does great because um, it's potentially a pathway to more interesting talent in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, I think the thing said, you said he'd be draft eligible in 2027. Mm -hmm. If he stayed in Japan, you're talking 2030 something as the earliest that he's going to come over. And yeah, so it's a risk, but this wasn't him waking up one morning and saying, sure. Hey dad, I feel like this might be something I want to do. <laughs> right. This was right. rich people saying, you know what? I think this guy might. Yep. And that's what makes it more fascinating. Yep. And especially the fact that his dad advised Otani, lots of interesting layers uh, will be interested to, to track. We'll have to keep folks up to date on that story. If his dad advises Otani, he's taken a little bit of that, 18 bajillion dollars that <laughs> yeah. this off season. So money might be such an issue for there you go. This is true. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We're we're looking at some visuals of a what Jeremy described as a stocky, I believe. A stocky yeah. powerful first base type. Uh, but wait to you know, trust me, just go look up go look him up on Twitter, hitting some absolute nukes to all parts of the field. It's very interesting. You said stocky, I said short and heavy. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, I'm more asset based than you clearly. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about rookies. Um, we're in the playoffs. And one thing I think that's true in addition to the Cubs, Brewers and Twins having interesting minor leagues, um, systems is all three orgs have had interesting and impactful contributions in 2023 than rookies so i want to put a little bit of a cap and an exclamation point on the rookie class for each organization so we have a range of disappointing outcomes for our teams right the cubs um the cubs september capitulation absolutely brutal missing the playoffs the brewers meek 
wildcard exit to the Twins. When I wrote this, I didn't know what was going to happen, but um, the Twins Divisional Series exit to the Astros. Uh, but we want to highlight some rookies that made a significant impact on their team's season. Doesn't necessarily have to be rookie of the year, um, but we've each picked one for each org that we're going to kind of highlight, um, talk through kind of their impact um, and why we landed on them. So we'll start, we'll start, we'll go in order in which teams were eliminated from playoff contention or the playoffs. So we'll start with the Cubs. <clears throat> Jeremy, who's, who are you going to pick? So I think the, the Cubs class on a whole was, was kind of underwhelming. Yeah. Uh, but I went with Javier Assad. And I think mostly because he kind of put himself on the map with a strong performance in the WBC. Yep. When you think back to, to mid-March, that was a really fun, fun series. It was. And guys kind of put themselves on the map. And I think that was, for him, that was when he kind of inserted himself into the conversation. And not necessarily as a rotation guy, um, but onto their – you know, opening day staff as a, as a swingman, long relief type. Uh, but then into their rotation and made a mm -hmm. lot of starts and, and was, was good for them. Now, is he going to stick in their rotation? I don't think if the Cubs want to consider themselves contenders that he's, the you know, the number five guy. Mm -hmm. um, and we can t we'll talk about this more later when we when we answer some questions, but you need to have a, a rotation that has seven or eight. And mm -hmm. he's established himself, you know, that the Cubs can look at, at the future and say, yep, he's a part of that. He's a he's a valuable piece of our pitching staff. Yep. Not necessarily our rotation, not necessarily our bullpen. Um, but his, just his season overall, um, you know, I don't think it was – it was better than people expected going in. Um, is he going to get rookie of the year votes? No. Should he? No. Um, mm -hmm. But a valuable piece on a, on a team that was in the thick of it until the end of the season. Yep. Yep. That's a good, you know what? When I first saw your pick, I was like, eh, it's kind of underwhelming because the ceiling's limited. But I, I guess if we've learned anything from the 2023 Minnesota twins is that depth is critical um mm -hmm. and he absolutely was there when the cubs needed someone and when they were struggling during this brutal september stretch um so that's real you need you need guys to step up do a job step into holes and Assad did that pretty admirably i think um i'm i'm gonna kind of like misunderstand the assignment on purpose for for all of my guys a little bit i think um because there's a little bit of a trend in my guys of like not necessarily accruing a ton of playing time, um, but going to focus on a little bit of a, a combination of like both performance and future upside. Because um, at the end of the day, we always talk about being interested in impact talent. So I'm going to go Jordan Wicks. Um, he had seven starts, I think, down the stretch, one incredibly brutal, important start against the Brewers in which he gave up like six or seven earned runs and just a couple of innings, he got yanked. Every other start was just a model of consistency without having overwhelming stuff. Um, lefty starter, very consistent. Unlike Assad, I think he is absolutely set up to be a kind of staple of that rotation. Um, be interested to see what happens with, with Marcus Stroman in the off season. He has an opt out. Um, you've got Steele, you've got Cade Horton coming down the line. They have the makings of something nice going on, um, on the North side with their rotation and, and Jordan Wicks is going to be a big part of that. So, so he's my pick. Um, we left space for honorable mentions for each team. I want to give like a dishonorable mention. <laughs> Not like, not like for the player, because that's mean, but like, I'm just, I cannot get over PCA's usage, man. We like did like half an episode on him when he came up September 11th. Guess how many plate appearances he had after he was promoted? Um, I don't know the amount, but I think he had zero hits. 19 plate appearances. Yeah. I just like, what, what, what are we doing here? Um, so 
so the twins way back they when rosters expanded they brought kepler up mm. like his first year and he didn't really do anything that rules were different um he didn't really serve a purpose but just the exposure to right the big leagues um so maybe maybe it had something to do with that seems silly because they were in a race but i get your disappointment but i also get the value that it provides also you're you're saying we're willing to pay you big league money this is true to just sit around yep i get it zero hits confirmed by producer theo as always the mvp behind the scenes i just like the cubs were in such a brutal slide and he was getting at bats like one at a time um getting plate appearances one at a time it just felt like a tough ask and assignment and i wish he'd gotten a little more run looking forward to seeing what he has to offer obviously in 2024 um let's talk about let's move on talk about the brewers brewers i think a little bit more of an interesting rookie class here right like possible guys joey weimer abna uribe bryce terang sal frelick andrew monasterio anyone jump out to you from the brew crew yeah so i think it's interesting because you talked about what your theme is you know yeah. performance and upside and i'm always a, a upside lean but for this for the rookies especially and i think it, you kind of see the you'll see the build up of these three teams mm-hmm. the, the the best ability that you have especially when you're young is what availability, availability. right womp, womp. and so bryce terang was not especially good in fact he was you could argue not good but he played in the 130 some games 140 some games defense was was fine Mm -hmm. uh he he's 20 23 year old which isn't young but not old former first round pick basically played every day was was sent down to triple a for 15 games and batted i think almost 300 triple a million um and he's he's valuable to the organization especially when you think about the brewers and kind of the revolving door of infielders that they've had over the last mm-hmm. half dozen years former top 100 prospect he's going to get better he didn't walk much but for a rookie who has his kind of hitter profile he didn't strike out as much as i would have anticipated he, he would strike out either yeah uh, 585 ops not great, uh, but I think you can feel good about penciling him into or onto your opening day roster. Mm-hmm. You could always upgrade that position, right? But he could he could provide depth, and I don't think he's a second baseman by way of moving down the defensive spectrum and landing there. Mm-hmm. I think there's if he becomes a utility guy, uh, there's value there, and I and I. I, I don't know how it's going to be. There's definitely there's sexier names in the Brewers system and as, as as rookies, but I think he provides a value and that that it's it's harder to replicate because you can't just pick anybody up off the scrap heap that's going to give you 145 games. Yep. And uh, and that's where I I leaned here too. There was other names, better names, probably better performing years, um, but he was he was and he was good out of the gate too. So I think there's. Mm-hmm still upside there for for him and for brewers fans for sure i i mean he's an interesting example too right of like god the brewers have so many questions on offense going into their you know roster construction for 2024 i'm really interested to see what that lineup looks like next year hear what you're saying on the slow and steady but i cannot get behind a 60 wrc plus of the plate that is giving me pause especially in like a solid sample size, right? So it makes me yep. a little nervous about the adjustments that are being made or not. I'm going to go Sal Frelick, um, 15th overall pick in the 2021 draft. Um, and there's a number of reasons I like him, right? So uh, primarily there's a little bit of a theme with PCA, right? The defense and the speed is going to give you a really solid floor there, a really solid kind of platform. Um, a mass 1.5 F4 in 57 games. So pretty impactful in a relatively short span of time. 
92 WRC plus. So it's kind of holding his own with the bat, like a little bit below average. There's not going to be a lot of power there. Um, but there's some, some good indicators, I think, in his approach to the plate. Um, K percentage, just 16.6, not too shabby. Uh, walked close to 13% of the time. That is absolutely something to build on. I think Eddie Julian is what, like 15, 16% of the time. So that's, that's pretty impressive. I think you have a pretty exciting foundation there. If you can take even a small step forwards at the plate. I mean, if we're kind of parsing this out over a full season, we're looking at like a, I'm trying to do my math, like a three and a half to four war player. That's a pretty exciting foundation. And some of the plays he made in center field had me wondering whether it's going to be him or Jackson Churio play in that position long-term for the Brewers. I think maybe his defense is, and his speed is even good enough to, to push Jackson Churio into right field. So Sal Frelick is my pick. Um, yeah, that's what I'm going with. As long as we're on the Brewers, I think there's – with uh, Stearns headed to New York and becoming the, the top guy mm -hmm. and Council being kind of a free agent, I think there's a lot of things that are that are possible here for the Brewers and their leadership and how this team looks going forward. Because Council had a very unique way of handling things. Mm -hmm. Really, I, I feel like it's accurate to say they overachieved every year. Like you looked at the rotation, it's like, Okay, Woodruff and Burns, and then Peralta. They didn't always have those horses, yet they always found a way to make it into the postseason. And I think that Council is really underappreciated, uh, you know, by by the hometown fans. And I think that's not uncommon. I think Baldelli is too. But Stearns has ha, and him worked really well together. I'm not sure looking for a coach. Nah. probably feel the you know he feels the heat a little bit i don't know if he wants to go to the bright lights he's got younger kids in you know locally but that to me seems like a match made in in uh gm man manager heaven interesting interesting i had not thought of that i do that is like really the question for the brewers right like is cancel going to be with them at the beginning of next year that is kind of an interesting thought exercise Something something the beginning of your point also had me thinking about was as we're going through these rookies for each team, are all of them still with their organizations next year when we get to opening day, right? Um, that's another thing I'm really excited about for the off season now that we're finally here, man, is like when trades start happening, where you get to break down all of the prospect side of those, it's going to be super fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, last but not least, Twins uh, eliminated from the playoffs yesterday. Possible picks here. Cody Funderburg, in no particular order, Cody Funderburg, Louis Varland, Matt Walner, Eddie Julian, Royce Lewis. Fair to say a pretty historic rookie class especially if we're looking at the hitters, who's your pick, man? Tough choice. Yeah, it really is. Uh, but I think Eddie Julian is the one for me to highlight. And that's that's no knock on Royce Lewis. What he did coming back from a second ACL, um, doing what he did down the stretch with all the grand slams and the big spots and the home runs in the postseason, like he's great. But I don't think this season – from the beginning. I don't think Royce Lewis really gets the opportunity to do what he did if it wasn't Freddie Julian coming up and being what he was. Um, the WBC success, you know, hitting home runs for Canada yeah. as a leadoff guy, really kind of propelled him, like Assad, into the conversation yep. of Good shot. the Twins need to play this guy. Yep. Uh, and there was no spot, but um, it doesn't happen if they don't trade a rise. There's no Pablo Lopez without Julian like there's just you know the the, the butterfly effect yep. uh, and for me arguably the best player the twins had for a really long stretch this season the the Polanco being dinged up I mean he was dinged up before but he gets dinged up early he comes in and just kind of lights the world on fire mm -hmm. and uh that to me is is a, a huge deal because that getting getting the twins through April May June wasn't happening 
with all that he's doing. <laughs> Wasn't that fun? <laughs> and I think he's a long-term fit. I, again, I don't know where you, you – you can write him down on your lineup card somewhere in pencil because you could move him. He's not – I don't think he's the long-term answer at second base. I think ultimately the Twins bring Polanco back. But he's going to have a spot – for, for the foreseeable future a- and was maybe their second best player in the playoffs, you know, too. Oh, for sure. And so that's, that's, what's really cool. And, and just the, his development, I, I think, you know, we're talking about rookies, but he, he was one of, if not the most valuable hitter, for the twins entire yep. lineup. And I think that that really speaks to to how impactful he was and how how important he was to this team. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, man. Like I love your I love this pick. This is this is the best. This is the most I've ever agreed with you on the show. I think Julian maybe would have been mine too. Just like a couple of things to add, because I I just like I think his season's been so exciting. One, um He's kind of slump proof, right? Like the the on base percentage ability mean means that even when he's going through like a terrible stretch, um, he's still providing you with value. So that's one thing. Another thing I'd add about him, he got back to zero outs above average after looking shocking in uh, defense for, for his first couple of months. Dan Hayes just had a I think a really nice piece of the Athletic about how hard he worked at his infield defense. So I would echo what you said, not sure what the plan is there. But I think if you look at sometimes how passive he was at the plate, especially in two strike counts, like how many times did Eddie Julian strike out looking? Um, it was like 50 times. It was that, insane. He broke records. But there's there there's room to take a step forwards of the plate there, right? And, and get a little more um, calculatedly aggressive in certain counts. So I think that's a great pick. And he's also, before you move on, he's mm-hmm. also two minor league seasons, well, three years removed from a 34 stolen base season. Dang. Like, we didn't see that. He had Not at all. He was three for three this year. But in 2021, 34 stolen bases and 39 attempts in, with 18 home runs. So, like, could he be a 2020 guy? I would think that that's certainly a possibility in speed – Stealing bases suggests that he could actually move a little bit. And so I, I just think that his glove's not great, but no. there's value in, in finding a spot for him and, and probably the long-term leadoff hitter, right? I yeah. mean, Yes, 100%. Every time he came to the plate yesterday, I felt confident that he was in a sea of miserable twins at bats. I felt confident that, like, this is going to be, like, high quality, of, you know, this is going to be a high-quality plate appearance. He's going to walk. He's going to drive the ball, whatever. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I feel like a lot of his base running, obviously you, you say we didn't see the base stealing. He made some, we'll call them interesting plays on the bases in 2023. Uh, well, I'll call them bad. bad room, is- for, room for growth. Room for growth. Um, I'll go Royce. I'll go Royce Lewis. I think this is maybe the obvious pick. Um with 600 plate appearances, he would have surpassed six F war, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, he made great adjustments at the plate, increased his walks and decreased his strikeouts. Solid at third base, I think. I don't have metrics in front of me to back that up, but um, adjusted seemingly pretty comfort- comfortably there. Obviously, I think the... The headline here is like twice on the injured list, right? So return from a second major surgery, then was on the injured list for an oblique and a hamstring. Um, I think at this point, there is no doubt about Royce Lewis's ability. Um, And there were, without naming names, there are a lot of folks who um, doubted Royce Lewis's ability as a prospect. Um, Why are you not naming names? I'm not naming names because I'm not trying to start any Twitter beefs. Okay. Not doing it. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> um, can Royce Lewis stay on the field for 130, 140 games next season? That is a big if, but he is absolutely one of the anchors of the lineup for the next five years. I think him and Julian were 
in addition to Correa, who kind of did all of his offense in, in the games in Houston, but Juliana Royce both outperformed their regular season numbers in the playoffs, um, and they were already impressive. Um, so he would be my pick. Unbelievable rookie class for the Twins. you got to be excited if you're a Twins fan there. Absolutely. Yeah, 24 years old. And and to think he missed, like, two two seasons, three seasons. With Insane. The um, I'm just looking at his line. 58 games, 15 home runs, 58, 52 RBI. Like, if he even plays 130 games at that rate, like, that's going to be – Ridiculous. He's going to – that's going to be a guy that you're like, oh, yeah, he's an MVP type candidate. Right. Down ballot MVP votes for sure. So, th- over 37% on base. Like, oh. fun at bats too. That's kind of wild too because – I, we'd need to look at splits, but I recall earlier in the season, he was not really taking any walks and still had a relatively high strikeout rate. And I think that significantly approved with some some adjustments at the plate. So that is a, a welcome and I think challenging to do midseason uh, development there. Where do you play him next year? I'm going to play him at third base. Okay. Brooks Lee is not going to start the season with the Twins, um, I think. I think they'll bring back Polanco. I think it'll kind of be as you were infield, honestly, at the beginning. I What I'm wondering about is who's going to play first base. I know Julian started getting reps there. Um, the Twins absolutely need more offensive production out of first base. Kirilov, it sounds like, is maybe set for shoulder surgery. Uh, Donnie Barrels had a good season, but he's not He's not he's, a full-time first baseman. Well, nor is like he coming back. 36 years old. Right. Ideally, they'd have a right-handed bat there, maybe. We will see. I'm going to say, given the improvement he's made uh, defensively, that Julian gets uh, at least some some playing time at second base and Roy starts a year at third. Okay. I want, well, I want to ask you one more question. I'll put you on the okay. spot. After next year, so yep. starting in 2025, where does Royce Lewis play the majority of his defensive games? Maybe second base. Mm. No, I mean, the answer should be center field. Exactly. The answer should be center field. Okay. I think, always, like, always run the same page. He could play any, any, the for only sure. place I wouldn't play him is first base. Agreed. Right? He could play center field, he could play shortstop. Second base would be the last place I'd want to put him. Yeah, I, I think he would be good in either of the corners, right, right or left. And, and if you have him, if you discussion. if you have him at center field, though, he's going to rack up even more value because he's going to be solid defensively, and the 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 bar for offense in center field is what like he would be one of the better offensive center fielders in the league if you stick yeah. him there today. Theo says Boris doesn't want to play him off the dirt. Right. If I'm the twins, if I'm gonna grind him, him down. Field, if if I'm the twins and put him in center field, he's just become way more costly. This is true. And so that's where that becomes a fascinating thing. Do you think they try to try to enter in some uh, long term discussions with him this offseason? I kind of like feel like they may have like missed the boat on doing that in like a team team friendly way already. Like, I mean, he has. He's coming off like a, a historic rookie season, albeit in a small sample size. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I certainly would. Um, they certainly have payroll flexibility coming into the 23 offseason. And there's always ways to format a deal to make it both team sure. and player friendly. Because it's guaranteed sure. money that you otherwise don't have with two repaired ACLs. Yep. That's a big thing to me. Uh, I got to give an honorable mention, man. I got to do it. Cody Funderburk. We, I, we, not we, like not you and me, the Royal we, we have not talked enough about Funderburk's debut with the Twins. He has, in my opinion, absolutely cemented himself in the bullpen for opening day 2024, 075 ERA. If we look at some of the underlying numbers there, right? And this is a small sample size. This is 12 innings in the majors, but expected ERA 246, FIP 267, XFIP 255, amassed 0.3 F war in just 12 innings pitched. Strikeout rate is ridiculous. He's striking out 14 guys per nine. Um, Walk rate is a little high, 3.75 per nine. Um, even with 
a solid amount of regression. Even if Cody Funderburk was a league average left-handed relief pitcher, he should be in the bullpen next year, but he has been incredibly impressive. Um, and just like another homegrown mid to later round guy. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and having that second lefty hugely valuable. Yep. In fact, leaving him off the roster against the Astros to me was like, what, why not? Why wouldn't you want to have yesterday? Why wouldn't you want to have another lefty to go at Alvarez? Mm -hmm. Like that to me was, was a weird thing. Thielbar was great, but Thielbar's obviously getting older. I think Funderburg could fill that role, yep. you know, for a while. For sure. A hundred percent agree. Um, all right. We're going to finish up with some listener questions. That is going to do it for recapping the rookies. That was fun, man. I'm really, I, I am excited to track these guys heading into 2024, a really exciting crop of players for each team, whether they had strong debuts or did not debut enough. Um, there's going to be plenty to talk about. We've got some listener questions. Uh, as always, thank you guys for sending them in. We need to get Josiah Waldner like a uh, like a merch, like a T-shirt, because he's always sending us questions. Um, which hitting and pitching prospects are you most excited to see and track in the 2024 season? This was not specified whether this is Twins specific or, um, you know, any prospect in baseball. So you can take it where you want, my man. Go for it. All right, so Walker Jenkins obviously is is my twin's choice mm -hmm. because he's he's a he's this hitter that is going to be super advanced for whatever level he's at and at a young age. So I think that's that's one to watch for sure. Um, I'm guessing you're going to have some some maybe a prep pitcher that you're going to say when he comes to you. So I went Jenkins, <clears throat> uh, but I'm really curious to see how Kate Horton pitches for the Cubs because I think you know I kind of mentioned him as a dark horse in the Rookie of the Year deal mm -hmm. um still relatively new to pitching and so just to see how that development because usually development when you haven't done things is more of a mm -hmm. uh, you know there, there's there's way more upside um for the brewers all those prep guys they took last year like where does cooper pratt end up is kind of a big thing because he dropped um and just the comps that have been put on him as a as a bigger shortstop type and how do they really handle all those guys together is is a is going to be fun because I think the ceilings are all really high. Some guys are going to take off, yep. but the floors are also very low and very realistic. You know what I mean? I do. And so which guys are going to kind of fall apart there? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, outside of those teams, Wyatt Langford was one of my favorite uh, yeah. prospects in all of the draft, uh, and what he did in in the in the system for the Rangers and just kind of you know kept moving up and kept hitting. Um, and now they're in the ALCS and they're going to be, you know, potentially a world series team. And then you have this young stud. He's going to be a monster. Like that's, that's fun if you're a Rangers fan. Um, and then I think too, you know, I was a big fan of Steven Strasburg coming out of San Diego state. And then I remember watching his debut. This to me, Paul Skeens, his debut for the pirates is going to be the most watched rookie debut since mm -hmm. Strasburg. And then how quickly does Paul Skeens become a top 10 pitcher in the major leagues? Because I think that's something that's going to happen relatively quickly. Like we might be having conversations a year from now saying, yeah, Paul Skeens is a top 10 pitcher in all of baseball, which is which is crazy, but I think very, very realistic. I don't think Paul Skeens is going to be the top pitcher from his draft class. Whoa. I think Theo just sat up. He sat up in his chair when you said that. So now you got to spill because you, it's your turn. So this segues into my guys. I'll come back to that in a second. No, let's let's just again. My non-twins guys. I'm gonna give a couple, but we'll start with that comment that I made. Kirsten Waldrop is my guy. Okay. Um, Atlanta Braves selection went in the mid twenties uh, overall. Fell should not have fallen that far. Some of the nastiest, nastiest stuff in the draft. Already up to double A by the end of the season. Atlanta likes to move their guys along. He has three plus to double plus pitches, potentially. Um, the only guy, I think, in the draft class that you could say has comparable stuff to Skeens. Obviously, the, the velocity is not quite the same, although he's, you know, touched 98, 99 with the fastball. 
Waldrop is the guy that I think has the stuff to rival Skeens. He was my favorite pitcher in the draft. That's a guy I'm really interested to see. I will be absolutely shocked if he does not debut in the majors next year. Okay. Time um, stamp that one, Peel. Time stamp it. Call me out next year when it's a disaster. Um, twins wise, I'm gonna go Charlie Soto. That's, there you are. I am. I can't wait to see Charlie Soto throw man. I cannot wait. Um, how can you not love a like physical prep pitcher with amazing velo and amazing stuff? Like that's just exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't rush their pitches long after they draft them, so you know we get the anticipation of waiting. Now, I'm going to give a couple more names. Um, some of my my favorite prep hitters from this class that are also not twins. So my bad for kind of skipping around. Detroit Tigers duo Max Clark, everybody knows about. Kevin McGonigal is the guy they selected in comp round A. He is a, just a really, really great hit tool. He'll probably play second base long term. That's a guy I would look out for. Got off to a solid start in pro ball. And then I'm going to go Aiden Miller, who fell a little bit, um, was drafted by the Phillies, third baseman, Florida prep kid, like big, big power, good hit tool. Um, I think he's going to be an absolute monster. So he's a guy I will be tracking closely next year. Um, those are my guys. Last question. Last question of the day uh, from Cody Shoneman, fellow Twins Daily Writer. Could you see the Twins pursuing either Eduardo Rodriguez or Blake Snell this upcoming offseason? How do you think the 2024 rotation looks come opening day? So I don't one. think I don't think Blake Snell and I don't really think Eduardo Rodriguez either, even though it sounded like they were in on him at the trade deadline. He has an opt out, I think, right? Um that's gonna be a maybe a yeah. quick Theo research question. I think Eduardo Rodriguez has an opt out after this season. I could but be that, right. But that was the the whole he was gonna go to the Dodgers, but was he not really going to go to the Dodgers and Sonny Gray was going to go to the Dodgers and Rodriguez was going to come to Minnesota. Like there was a thing there where the twins were pursuing him. And so even with that, I don't, I don't know that the twins want to compete with 29 other teams Mm -hmm. with their checkbooks. They're not, they're not the cheap pole ends of before, but they're also not going to just start bankrolling. I mean, the Korea thing, that was surprising, but that's just not how the team's <laughs> going to operate. Um, I think if Jordan Montgomery mm. is falls in that next tier, he would be a guy that I think would be intriguing, you know, with that profile. Has had success, um, is still younger-ish, mm-hmm. uh, but he might have priced himself out of out of the Twins market. I think so. He's had a good Brady, postseason, man. Jack Flaherty, who was bad for the Cardinals, but has been really no, good and is still young, um, feels like the type of player the Twins would maybe pursue. Um, and then I think you you have to take a, a shot on some kind of scrap heap guys mm-hmm. just to see if there's anything left. Um, the rotation, Pablo Lopez is going to lead it. They're going to QO. They're going to QO Sonny Gray, and he's going to be gone. But if he comes back, great. Paddock probably is their number, well, is a Ryan? mid-rotation guy. Joe yeah. Ryan's a mid-rotation guy. Bailey Ober is a mid-rotation guy. Yep. And so you have four spots pretty much cemented. Um, I don't think, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if they if they talked to Maeda. I think Maeda was comfortable here. I think he had success here. At, and uh, ultimately, I think he'll take money to go somewhere else, probably mm-hmm. to a post. Um, and Varlin then would slot in as your number five, which – you want to upgrade that, but you need more depth. You need, yep. you need six, seven, eight guys. So um, don't forget future top 100 prospect David Festa, who is going to be next year's Louis Varland, who we talked about a couple yeah, of weeks I, ago. He's your he, number six. He's he's fine in that conversation, and I wouldn't I wouldn't even say Woods Richardson isn't, you know, going to be a depth piece. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, this team should win the AL Central, and you're going to want eight quality starters. Yep. And if Festa, like Josh Winder, isn't going to be a starter, there's value 
as, as, a, as a bullpen guy. For sure. So Tyler Malley, does that, do you want to go down that road again? I think there's value there. Um, I think if the Twins really were interested in that, that would have been something that they pursued in season as they mm-hmm. rehab him. Like, so I don't know if, because they did that with Paddock. They did it with uh, Pineda back yep. in the day. And so I just, I wondered if there's stuff about his rehab that the, kind of turned the Twins off. I don't know mm-hmm. that. It's purely speculation. Yep. Uh, but then you just, you look for these guys, you sign them to one-year deal, and the, there's your most like, likely outcome is that you've signed a depth piece guy. Mm-hmm. Um, Dylan Bundy type, uh, Chris Archer type, where they're not super exciting. They will provide you with your 120 to 140, 100 and whatever innings. If they're bad, you could move on and just be on a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. If they're really, really good, now you have the opportunity to QO them and get something out of it. So I don't I don't see the the big names being the shots they want to go at. Um, but I think you, you that's that second tier and then that tier where it's like, oh, we like what we maybe could do with this pitch if we reshape it. Mm-hmm. Tech guys, I just I don't have the 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 knowledge to be able to look at it and and, and like the, the twins do. And I think they do a really good job at that. So I could see them finding a guy that doesn't excite us that all of a sudden turns into a very, very usable quality starter. Yep. Yeah. I think I agree with that assessment overall. I don't think they're going to spend on pitching. I think extending Pablo was the spending on pitching. I think they'd love to have gray back if he accepted a QO. I don't think he would. I don't think they'll pay market rate for him at like a Bassett, like 368 deal or, or whatever that would look like. So I agree. I think if they get a more interesting starting pitching option or acquisition, that's going to be through trade. Um, otherwise, you're looking at depth ads and the rotation is pretty much going to be running it back from this year. And I think one of the interesting kind of roster construction questions this offseason is going to be, how do you replace Sonny Gray's 5.6 F war in the rotation next year, right? Because we feel great about Pablo after that playoff domination in Houston. Paddock looked amazing in the playoffs, um, but he wasn't starting. No, no. So his velo is not going to be quite there, but his stuff looked really, really great. You need Joe Ryan to develop a reliable and consistent secondary pitch um, to make him more effective behind the fastball. Ober was at a career high in innings this year. Can he um, can he pitch a full season next year? Can Barlin keep the home runs under control? I think there, if you run it back, that's fine. But I do think there is at least one fair question to ask of each of those guys with the exception of paddock um and you have to make up for a five war pitcher who you're not going to have so it's an in- interesting question but i do not see them spending money on it so how much confidence will it take the twins to have in paddock to say yep yeah, we're he's going to be you know our number two or our number if you look back to his rookie year at San Diego, he was phenomenal. 153 mm-hmm. strikeouts and 140 innings, a whip of 0.98, K per nine of almost 10. Like, dude, dude was really good and was not that great. I mean, it was 22 innings for the Twins in, in 2022, but 20 strikeouts in, in, in 22 innings. Whip was a little bit higher, but you're looking at a pretty small sample size. His FIP was 1.72. Like that would that would be a. I just think there's. I think they're fully that deal with him was a was huge for yeah. the future. I think they're fully confident in that already. I think they're fully confident that he's going to be Ryan caliber from this season or better. That's what I think. Uh, yeah. Producer Theo says Dan Hayes. Suggested on Gleeman and the Geeks Patreon a minor league reunion with Jake Odorizzi. Um, Love it. Yeah, that's the kind of yeah, that's the kind of depth signing I think that makes a lot of sense if you're going to mostly run it back to get you to your like seven or eight guys. Um, makes that, good sense. That that to me, and they know they have a really good idea how he'd fit in the clubhouse. Mm-hmm. They have a really good idea of of how he would react or 
take in the information that he's definitely going to be given. That's the type of stuff that these these teams are looking – this team particularly is looking at. It's how they fit with a team that's pretty well established. They got rid of the guys they needed to get rid of, and they've built a, a pretty strong culture that I I think is it's on the right track, led by Carlos Correa. Yep, yep. Exciting stuff ahead with the offseason. We are – going to call it a day for today thank you guys for sending in questions we always truly appreciate it um disappointed that none of our teams are left in the playoffs but absolutely very excited to continue to cover and break things down we are planning on recording every single week through the off season breaking down roster stuff draft stuff trades um anything that comes up couple of housekeeping notes that I forgot on the front end that I got to mention because they're important for us. Um, we're on Twitter at DTS underscore pod one. Drop us a follow. Um, we're always tweeting out our stuff, our content, our episodes, um, and ways that you can support the show. And we really, really appreciate um, anyone who is kind enough to do these. Um, download the episodes on your preferred podcast platform. Um, anytime you re retweet us or retweet us sharing an episode, it helps us grow the show, um, and reach more folks. Um, and if you like what you heard, um, you can leave us a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, and subscribe to the twins daily YouTube channel. Um, as always. Big thank you to producer Theo for making everything happen behind the scenes as always the MVP. Um, and Jeremy, you and I will be back next week when we will be doing some Arizona Fall League updates. We're going to start doing some real in-depth breakdowns of each team's minor league system. And just to drop a teaser, we have a guest lined up for two weeks from now. And we're not going to say who. It's somebody's mom, though. I bet. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna hold on to that for now, but I think um, I think folks are really gonna enjoy it. Gonna provide some some really great insights. Um, so until next time, you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. We appreciate it.